the hardest thing about making the film was making sure that we were providing a memory that you know justified what the passengers went through something that that spoke the truth and something reflected their courage and and apparently that's how the audience perceived it and the families as well get a run at me okay, well how I this corridor remember they knew through their phone that this was a suicide mission and they weren't going to let it happen they all got together and did something about it Executive 956. Go ahead, Executive 956. Just answering your call. We could hear that uh, yelling too. I recreated the events on Flight 93 through a number of articles and books that had been written on it. We were in touch with Steve Levin of the um, Pittsburgh Post Gazette. He became our point man for um, contact with the families and for the timeline. There are transcriptions of conversations between the Cleveland controller and Flight 93 after it was taken over. In situations where we didn't know what people said, but where they had to say something, we stayed with what they would have said under those circumstances. There are some transcripts which apparently did record some of the language of the terrorists. The language that they used to announce the kidnapping comes over the recorded conversation between the Cleveland controller and the plane. Jar made a mistake, pushed the wrong button, and transmitted what he felt was a, a, a communication to the passengers instead to Cleveland Tower. United 93. Calling United 93. Oh, I don't hear you have a bomb on board. United 93. Calling United. So that's on tape. What they said to one another, um, we made up. Basically, it took place over a period of an hour. Uh, and we weren't shooting it in real time, but we were trying to stay consistent with the, the time schedule, the time frame, uh, which was the main way that we were able to stay true to the facts. The hijackers are saying there's a bomb on board. They've already knifed a guy. Please call the authorities. Tom? Tom? I took a kind of cross-country tour to meet the people who we knew we were going to use. Uh, I started in the Bay Area, and I talked to Alice Hoglin, who was um, Mark Bingham's mother. And I went to Little Rock, Arkansas, and spoke with Dina Burnett. And I talked also to uh, Meredith Rothenberg, who was Mickey Rothenberg's uh, wife, the, the man we feel was killed in the opening minutes of the hijacking. I was on Nevin's shoulders and my shoulders in terms of how we're going to exploit it. But he came out with this wonderful script that showed the relationship, you know, between the Burnetts and the Glicks and Alice Hoagland with her son. and. And you could feel. Elizabeth, um, I have my arms around you, and I am holding you, and I love you. So the only conversation that was recorded from the plane was a conversation from Todd Beamer to Lisa Jefferson at uh, Verizon. You said, do me a favor. Of course. Say the Lord's Prayer with me. Right now, Todd? Okay. <laughs> From the very beginning, it was not really our intention to characterize the terrorists except through their actions. One thing we didn't want, the typical heavy-handed terrorists. They had a, a mission. One kid was scared as hell. So we pre presented them as human within what they, what they had to do. Uh, I thought that that aspect of it, Peter did really brilliantly. I thought he conveyed an undemonized portrait of people who, were, at least some of whom knew they were going to die, and uh, who were determined and very fearful at the same time. It was, it was difficult because there wasn't a lot of information, and there was a book that was almost concurrent with pre-production uh, by Terry McDermott, which is, is the definitive book on the, on the ter terrorists. Uh, called Perfect Soldiers, and actually my lead terrorist, Amin Nazemzadeh, who, who played uh, Zaid uh, Jara, had read that, and he based his character primarily on Terry's book. Uh, but there was some information, more on Jara than anybody else, because he was very close with Muhammad Atta, who really was the ringleader. And uh, they both went to, uh, studied aer aeronautical engineering at, uh, at Hamburg, so they, they did get to know each other. And Al Haznawi did spend some time, I think more or less as a gopher, 
uh, for uh, Jara when he was in, in Germany. He was an intelligent person. Everybody who uh, knew him in Lebanon and even in Germany remarked on how personable he was. Um, his family to this day does not believe Jara hijacked this plane. They believe that Jara was kidnapped and killed, his identity stolen, and someone who called themselves by their son's name um, took over that plane and crashed it. The other hijackers are ciphers. Um, they were able to track their movements. In one case, I think it's Khahamdi, but I'm not sure. They don't even know exactly what country he's from. And we also knew that each of them got a little booklet penned by Muhammad Atta the, two or three days before they left uh, in terms of how to prepare yourself. Uh, you know, you shave your body, you put on cologne, you pray. Uh, there's a whole list of things that they did and passages that they read to prepare for the, you know, for, for the, the event the following day. It's hard to say a shoot like this would go smoothly. It was extremely emotional. It was essentially sh shot in two levels, on the ground with the families and the, and the children, and then in the air with the passengers. So it was, we're really we're making two different films. And then the crash site and, and the FAA and the Boston Controller were also communicating with the, with, with the airplane. Uh, and the plane obviously is more like a submarine movie. It's, it's very, it's, you're in an MRI tube. It's very claustrophobic and it's just a lot of activity and your constricted movement and so forth. And, and on the ground, it was such a beautiful day. So we were very fortunate that we had pretty good weather. I mean, it was excellent weather. So we tried to shoot with windows in the background where you could see the trees and the blue sky and the puffy clouds and so forth, uh, which was in contrast to the, to the horror, horror at 30,000 30, feet or 10,000 feet, depending upon the time timeline. You know, they're worried about it. It was a controversial thing, the whole 9-11 environment. And I think they're kind of worried about how would it be done. We don't quite know some of the things inside. I think planes from Southridge are 23 minutes from contact with Flight 93. That's our GTA, isn't it? No one knows for certain. The estimation is that 93 is 19 minutes to the capital. Copy that, Dixie. This is Max Scott here. What's your readiness status? Beg your pardon, sir? In case you have to engage. Could you uh, repeat that, sir? Yes, what's your readiness status in case you have to shoot it down? We knew that Cheney gave the order to shoot the plane down at 10.15. The plane had crashed at 10.03. There are other people who say that orders were given while Flight 93 was still in the air. Again, this is, um, this is open material. I don't think that there are any conclusive answers whether the order was given at any particular time. Um, there are people who are always going to believe the plane was shot down. And I don't think that, the, that, that Rumsfeld having said of Flight 93, oh, you mean the plane, and, and plane we shot down over Pennsylvania really poured much cold water on that. You would think that Rumsfeld, of all people, would know, and it added a certain amount of fuel to the fire, although it was um, denied almost immediately. The military has to react somehow, and you're, you see how they reacted, and they weren't ready for it, and why would they have been? I, mean, I guess they should have been. I don't think that any, any government really would have acted that much more quickly. Uh, given the circumstances, you know, everybody was asleep. Nobody ever thought it would happen here. Now, maybe a different, a different story. Let's see a show of hands. We do know that from the black box, their assault on the cabin aborted the, the flight plan. The remarkable thing about this was that people acted as quickly as they did. I mean, you know, history is full of examples where people take. Uh, have taken five years to act, even though the knowledge of their deaths is a complete certainty. These people had no time. They, they, you know, from the time the plane, the plane was hijacked was, what, 40 minutes? And in that time, they actually managed to, to plan and stage an assault. It's really quite remarkable. Even as they say, the tragedy was the only light of a very, very dark, dark day in our history. So even though they were doomed, had a majestic approach to their fate. A lot of family members uh, wrote letters saying that they were very pleased with the film, that it, it, that it was a, a, a wonderful memorial to them as well. And to me, it is something that justifies what they, what they did. And no matter what, that day, these people, these civilians, were the only ones to stop the terrorists from reaching their target. And so I'm proud that we're able to put their story together. <laughs>